Good afternoon to all of our ISM chapters, members, and guests joining us today. Please be sure to ask our speaker any questions using the chat or the Q&A tab. Now on to our presentation for today. Our speaker for today is Tom Cook, who is the CEO and Managing Director of Blue Tiger International, a premier international business consulting company on supply chain management, trade compliance, purchasing global trade and logistics. Tom was the former CEO of American River International in New York in Apex Global Logistics Supply Chain Operation in Los Angeles. He has over 30 years of experience in assisting companies all over the world managing their import and export operations. He is a member of the New York District Export Council, sits on the board of numerous corporations and is considered a leader in the business verticals where he works. At this point, I'd like to turn the program over to Tom. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thank you all for attending and participating. And keep in mind that anytime you have a question, you're welcome to raise your hand and, and interject. Um, the more interactive we make the, uh, the meeting, the better that it will be. And again, I'm here to serve you. So whatever you have as a question or a comment, um, please feel free to jump in. Um, so as Kathy mentioned in the background, we're consultants in various topics around management and various topics around supply chain. Um, and in our management training sessions that we have, this whole subject of how to make better business and personal decisions always comes up. So it's been a study of ours as a, as a business model for a long time. So I wanted to thank um, Kathy for setting up this event. Uh, all the ISM chapters that she works for is lucky to have her. She does a great job at uh, coordinating these events and bringing you know, what I think is pertinent, sub pertinent subject matter uh, to the membership. And also Lindsay Dinney of my organization um, for structuring and uh, taking the time to set this event up. So the agenda for today is to discuss an overview of decision science and talk about it as both an art and a science and frame the parameters uh, that we're going to talk about. Um, its aspect relative to business applications. We're going to get in, in, into a conversation um, about emotional intelligence, which has a very direct impact on the making of decisions. The use in strategic negotiations and obviously all of us in uh, global supply chain are involved in negotiations all the time. And then closing with best practices. At the end of the day, what I'm trying to accomplish is for you to think through the decision-making process to ultimately be better at it. So um, when we do these webinars and the subject and we do it specific to a group of people, we try to orientate the conversation to the business vertical that they're in. And obviously as this is a supply chain organization, this is where the focus of this conversation is on supply chain, procurement and general management purposes. Part of the premise that we work on is that thoughts create a mindset. Mindset leads to decisions. Decisions lead to actions and all actions have consequences. And the obvious is that we're looking to create positive consequences as compared to negative consequences. But as we get into the conversation about fear and decision-making, we'll see how the thought of negative consequences influences our decision-making process. So making better decisions clearly produces better positive consequences, which is something we're all looking for. Decision science is by definition is a collaborative approach involving mathematical formula, business tactics, technological applications, and behavioral sciences to help senior management make data-driven decisions. Decision science management is making better decisions in business. And if we're able to make better decisions in business, it falls over into our personal lives. If we get better at it, it will have both an influence in our business model, as well as our personal circumstance. It achieves better and more desired results, and it allows us to have an easier time in our business and personal responsibilities. At the end of the day, it leads to more fulfilling and successful careers and personal lives when we can consistently 
not 100%, but raise that bar maybe above 90% of making better decisions. So what qualifies us to talk about this is not only because of our tenure in management, consulting, and training, but very specifically, we designed and made classes for Stony Brook University uh, on Long Island uh, and their graduate and their senior program. We've also run a number of management programs for the American Management Association, which is the largest corporate training organization in the world relative to making better decisions. We also do work for the National Institute for World Trade. And over the past 25 to 30 years, we chose to study the subject so that we as an organization would make better decisions and also the companies that we uh, you know, influenced and taught uh, would also be involved in making better decisions. So appreciate the fact that decision science management and that whole concept has two basic sides to it. One side is the science side, which is what we're going to talk about is quantitative. And the art side, which is more of the emotional, personal side, which is what we refer to as qualitative. The scientific side is process and data driven. It uses very traditional scientific methods and some people refer to it as pure and absolute mathematics. But all those things require a substantial flow of information being the more, more informed we are, the better we can draw down on algorithms, and formulas that make for better decisions. The art side of it, which happens to be where most of us make our decisions from, come from our experience, our intuition, our general sensibilities, our emotions involved, and also preconceptions and appreciate the fact that most of us whether it's conscious or subconscious, already have a significant volume of preconceptions, okay, and anticipated uh, results, uh, which have we've learned over time came from certain decisions that we made. So we're, you know, pre-allocated to those circumstances. So at the end of the day, when you ask the question, if it's both an art and science, which one works better? So there's a lot of implications in both of these areas. One is understanding that senior older individuals are more experienced and will tend to use that model of using their experience and intuition in making a decision as compared to younger, uh, less experienced individuals requiring more heavily on data-driven information. Think about senior management in your organizations who have allocated down to you to make decisions in particularly in supply chain and procurement where you're choosing a vendor or a supplier or negotiating with a vendor or supplier, you're negotiating price, you're negotiating terms and conditions. You think that they would want you to have better results in your decisions. So they have an expectation that there's a balance between the scientific approach as well as the experienced approach. And that is driven by the individual involved. Which is more easily mastered? Most people believe that the art of it is innate. People have it or they don't, okay? But most people involved in training and education know that yes, that's true. Some people on the artsy side have it and they don't, but other people can learn that aspect if they open their mind and open their capability and spend time in developing those skill sets. But at the end of the day, the mathematical side is much more easily learned because there's already very structured training that occurs once we start into first and second grade, all the way through college, all the way through graduate school, and all the applications that we use in business day to day which produces better results that could be argued in a number of different ways. But when you look at it from a scientific perspective, we're gonna talk about the fact that the scientific method generally produces better results. 
contemporary to us right now and, and a thing that we've all dealt with in our personal circumstances as well as the entire world being captivated by this COVID-19 pandemic, which started its root at the early part of last year. Think about how many times we listen to the news reports and listen to the politicians and the various scientists and doctors who would use the term, we need to follow the science. And now in retrospect, we look at that in some of those cases, the science really didn't provide the correct answers or provided, provided us with the best path to follow. In many cases, subjective information into the flow and experience into the flow weighed more heavily than the scientific side. But in balance, when we look at the steps that the country took and the world took and most businesses took relative to COVID, as well as most families and their personal circumstances, most actually followed the science or what they believed and perceived was the science. The end of the day, all people involved in negotiation, skill set training, um, we're going to get into the conversation about emotional intelligence and emotional equations, is that science will always trump the art side, mainly because you can create hard numbers and data in the process, which allows you to measure degrees of success. And quantitative, which is how scientists use the term, will always trump the qualitative side quantitative being the analytical, the scientific, the mathematical side, qualitative being more a result of experience and sensibilities um, and emotion. As individuals, we are trying to make better decisions and using both this art and science to the approach, but we have things that interfere and conflict with us. If you just take a look at the COVID issue that we've all been involved with for the last 18 months, think about how politics has so heavily played into the decision-making, not only as a country and as the world, but also think about the microchasms of, uh, of the area in New York or New Jersey or California okay, or Florida, how they dealt with these things very differently and it was brought into the equation, whether that was right or wrong. People's agendas came, come into play. Circumstances not under our control, and particularly the COVID problem, clearly demonstrated things that weren't under our control and things not easily influenced. The ability as humans to be and have certain errors and mistakes and faults in our process and who we are. The fact that information becomes interpretive and we all know at the political level, a tremendous amount of spinning occurs um, on things that have happened or a reinterpretation or a different historical perspective or a different sensibility of the chain of events and what caused it and what happened. And at the end of the day, most people involved in all aspects of business and life, and particularly in negotiation, particularly in our business and supply chain and procurement, where we're always trying to establish a consensus and a compromise in order to get where we want to be. When quantitative versus qualitative analysis, we have structured data on the quantitative side statistical analysis, objective conclusions, surveys, experiments that we can rely upon. Again, referring back to the COVID, think about the Moderna, the Pfizer, the Johnson & Johnson, the amount of time they had to put into the experimentation process to validate that in fact, the product was going to be safe and would ultimately work on our behalf. And as we know in the short term, that has been reasonably successful. As compared to the qualitative side, where it's unstructured data, summaries are drawn, conclusions are drawn based upon that. 
subjective conclusions based upon interviews, focus groups, and observations. Quantitative variables rely upon the amount of data that's involved in making a decision. And we all know that when we look at data, we have to look at the quality of that data, the term garbage in versus garbage out. The sources of that data becomes critical. The quality control, the organization, the structure of that data. And we know that once it comes out, there's interpreters and their interpretation. And two people could be looking at the same picture and see two different things. Two people can read a summary and a conclusion and make a different interpretation from it. And then we have the contemporary view and a lot of that has to do with the age of who we are, our experience and where we are in the packing order, either in our home on the personal life or in the business, uh, in our business model. Also appreciate that impacting the whole concept of decision-making is the media itself, particularly when we're watching TV, we're on cable news networks, we're watching the news reports on TV, we're, we're listening to the analysts, and also think about the internet and think about how quickly, if somebody makes a statement to us, makes a presentation to us, how quickly we can Google it to see the validity of what they're saying and the honesty of what they're saying, okay? Uh, it can be done instantaneously. Whereas we all know years ago, it took a long time to validate. Today, you can validate in moments. The information access of being able to go everywhere in the world electronically instantaneously. The speed today continues to increase and it really is instantaneous. Computer collation, assembly analysis is unbelievable. The search engines that we have access to, most of us are very familiar with Google. Advanced algorithms that, that exist, the training of science technicians and applicators are so advanced today. That's one of the reasons why the COVID um, immunization program took such a rapid pace and made historical advances so quickly was because of how quick information can be done and collated through technology. Qualitative variables, the emotional side of the issue, the sensibility side of the issue, is we're all individuals and we bring our individual persona, our individual mindset, and our individual uh, preconceived notions to the table every time we come involved in making a decision. There's always an agenda that people have. And it's not to say whether that agenda may be bad or good or positive or negative, but it's an agenda. The sources of where we get our information from, as stated previously, makes a huge impact. And then time and pressure, the idea that we don't have enough time to get everything done at the end of the day, and we have to draw down and conclusions, and make decisions, and appreciate the fact that the more rushed we are, generally will lead to uh, decisions that may not work, as, work out as well as we would anticipate. We have a unique sensitivity to the consequences. And we're gonna talk about fear in a moment, but the, the con concept of a consequence that has negative results concern us and influence us in how we make that decision. And appreciate that each person has their own sensibilities and sense of morals and ethics, which come into the equation as well. Always appreciate that a decision uh, can be one where we take the high road or one that we take the low road. So I wanted to give you simplified examples of quantitative analysis, particularly as it relates to the decisions that we might make in supply chain and in procurement. So this is a, a very simplified approach 
to quantifying a decision around choosing a particular supplier. In this particular case, and these are drawn from real examples, is a company is looking at um, four different companies to provide its corporate printing services. So down the left side, you see the companies Rico, HP, Minolta, and Canon are the four companies that are being evaluated. Across the top, you see that the people making the decision made a decision that they're going to look at the, the variable of price, the variable of customer service, the copy options that are available, the maintenance program that's being uh, offered, as well as the buyback program that's being done. And on a scale of one to five, they just assess how that company is okay, in that particular area. So as you can see, if you just look across the top, Rico in the area of sub, sub customer service on one to five was a five. HP was a four, Minolta was a four, Canon was a three. So in that category of, of determination, it's very easy to look at. Then we look at customer service and we look at the copy options, maintenance and buyback program, and we end, end up getting a total. So in this particular case, Minolta comes out highest as a 21.5. Um, and if that ends up being our method of selection, and it also is our sensibility, meaning our qualitative analysis also thought Minolta would come out on top, we now have a, a good circumstance where our quantitative analysis supports our qualitative analysis, and we made that decision. This information goes into the file, and if management ever questions us as to how we made that decision, okay, which could be good news or bad news, depending upon why they're asking, um, you could show a quantitative analysis validating that decision. And appreciate the fact if you have multiple people influence in decision, each one of those could create a grid like this, and then you bring the grids together uh, for a compulated uh, decision. The next one is a company that is looking at that same circumstance, but we add what's referred to as salience. And salience is something that's very important because it takes the same areas of review, but it weights those areas of review. And if there are multiple people who are doing the analysis, they can show a different weight how they feel the importance of a particular area is in evaluating a service provider. So in this particular case, you can see that what we've done is we've added the salience, which is the thing in quotient across the top. So price out of a one to five was considered a four, service was considered a four, copy options were considered a four, maintenance, which was an important issue to this particular individual, which was a five. The buyback program was important because obviously the technology moves these things along and you generally within a year or two years, you're looking to replace the equipment. Okay, so that became an important issue here. And hey, Tom, uh, we did get a question. Uh, I was on the previous slide. They wanted to know, was a quality measure already included in one of the these dimensions or is that missing here? The quality program is actually incorporated in this particular thing into the maintenance program. So they, in, uh, again, I'm simplifying. It was really uh, maintenance and quality control and access to technicians was really the three areas that came together. We just have it, uh, you know, led with the subject maintenance, but that's where it was put in there. I just wanna make sure I answered that person's question, Kathy. Yes, uh, they said, thank you. Okay. So coming back to this salience one is in this particular one with the salience added, it showed that um, uh, actually HP became a more viable candidate than Minolta when you added in the importance of those areas because they came out at 98, um, but Minolta is not too far behind at 95. 
So it could cause you to reduce the list to two and go back and, and review it again to see whether or not one or the other comes out on top when they're the only two doing it. But it gives you the ability to create a quantitative analysis in justifying the decision that you made to go with a particular company, service provider or supplier. Okay. And again, the point that I want to make is that if our sensibilities, meaning um, our qualitative concept supports what we find out by the numbers, then that's a really good situation to be in. If in fact it's in conflict, meaning that our sensibilities is 180 degree different than the conclusion of the quantitative analysis, it means we need to go back to the drawing board and redo our numbers and also rethink our sensibilities until they get aligned. In another example here, um, this one was actually one we just did uh, reason, just very reasonable, re, just re, uh, very um, lately um, with a particular company is this was a soft uh, uh, purchase of which insurance broker to particularly use um, in their business model. So they had uh, these companies, which you see on the left. And in this particular case, we looked at coverage, the technology uh, interface, okay, uh, the cost, customer service, okay, and their location relative to where the company was located, okay. And the idea was to create that grid, add the salience of the importance of those factors in there. And as you can see in this particular model, that national insurance brokerage in New York City came out on top and not by a huge amount, but but pretty defined as being the more significant provider. Okay, again, a step to companies to take is maybe look at the top two or three companies in this list and redo it without the others involved and see if it comes out and gives you the same support and so forth. Again, you're drawing down on quantitative analysis to show how you're using the concept of science and mathematics. Okay and data to make that decision. Here's one that I actually did in graduate school where I had the students take a look um, <clears throat> at Chick-fil-A stores. Um, Chick-fil-A, because uh, Stony Brook is located on Long Island, um, uh, Chick-fil-A had entered into the Long Island market um, several years ago. And they're now looking to expand it because their, their being here has been very successful. So I had the students come up with the question and the question was, where should the next Chick-fil-A store be located? So the criteria that they created was access to personnel, meaning the ability to hire people, uh, income of the community, population density of the community, religious demographics, and we put that in there because there is a religious element to Chick-fil-A, which is very different than other fast food restaurants. For those of you that know that, is they actually honor the Sunday as a religious day and that people should not be working and should be uh, at church. And the cost of locations and the transportation network that would be available where the location would be. And you can appreciate that we also weighted the importance of these different areas. That's where you see the 5%, 35%, 15. So weighted against 100%, okay? And then we looked at four particular cities, which was Riverhead, Long Island, Elmont, Long Island, Patchogue, Long Island, and Huntington, Long Island. And um, you do it both the straightforward way and the second way, which referred to as new is with the salience. And you can see that um, in the old way, clearly um, that potentially Patchogue comes out on top, but when you add salience, you know, into that mixture, then Patchogue actually still remains on top. And that's a good thing, which means that the combination of just a, a choice by using metrics, and then when we add salience to it, that both show that the choice that we're making works in both cases. And if our general sensibility, our emotional side of the equation and our experience side chose Patchogue as well, then that match makes it a really good fit 
that the quantitative side of analysis supported by all this math and metrics and science is, is falls in line with our own sensibilities as well and our experience. And that's really a good place to be. So we want to see it aligned that our quantitative analysis and our qualitative analysis matches. When it doesn't, it means we need to go back to the drawing board and do both again, do the metrics again to make sure that we did it correctly. And the second is also to think through how we came up to the decision on an emotional experience, sensibility, rationale. So when it isn't and when it's not, it's the concept of documenting how and why we made the decision and to support that in the file from a management standpoint, that's really a really best practice that particularly in tier one suppliers and vendors that we document the process of how we made the decision. And the more quantitative we can bring into that process, the better off we will generally be, particularly when being questioned and scrutinized to how we made that decision. Falling into this whole subject and something to heavily think about is the subject of emotional intelligence. And we bring this into the equation because our staff determined about seven or eight years ago that a number of studies that were done by the US military by a number of large universities and also a number of organizations involved in psychology determined that people with higher levels of emotional intelligence at the end of the day made better decisions. They were able to create the data necessary for quantitative and interpret it more correctly and also have what we call street smarts relative to making a better decision based upon experience and sensibilities. The, the definition of emotional intelligence is the capacity to be aware of control and express one's emotions and to handle interpersonal relationships judiciously and empathetic, empathetically. Emotional intelligence is the key to both personal and professional success as it aids in better decision making. More specifically, and tied into emotional intelligence, is our demeanor as an individual and our behavior towards others as an outward manner. And understand that our attitude defines our person as well and how we approach the decision making process. In psychology, attitude is a psychological construct, a mental and emotional entity that inheres in or characterizes a person. They are complex and are acquired state through experiences. Comes back to that qualitative side of decision making. Both EQ capabilities add to better decision making. I wrote a book of the 20 that I've put out there now. Um, one of them is on business development and sales management. And I have a section in there because one of the things that's been proven as well is that people who have high degree of emotional intelligence actually can sell better than those that don't. So I want to spend a little bit of time of some things I pulled out of that book um, discussing this because this is something that you all need to strive towards and try to develop. EQ is the distinguishing factor that term determines whether we make lemonade uh, when life hands us lemons or whether we spend our life in bitterness. Emotional intelligence is the distinguishing factor that enables us to have wholesome, warm relationships or cold distance ones. EQ is the signature factor between finding and living our lives, passions, or just existing. In the business world, they believe that emotional intelligence is the major factor of differentiation between mediocre managers and leaders and great ones. In the business world, however, so much of our emphasis has been placed on intellect. It has all been on IQ and analytical, factual, and measured reasoning power that IQ represents. Make no mistake, intellect has proven invaluable to drive success in business and life, financial decisions based on analytical details, sound strategies based on facts and data, and processes and procedures based on review and analysis are all critically important. But experts who study this subject matter all agree that emotional intelligence also connects to better decision-making when a robust intuition 
is part of a person's makeup. And I'm making the point that while a lot of this is innate in an individual, it is also something that can be learned and developed. So to further understand this, there are a couple of examples here that we can look at. The first is that these are definitions, is understanding that the job is not just thinking and doing, but get others to think and do, particularly for managers. Seeing yourself realistically and getting others to be more honest with themselves and with the world, and always appreciate that we enter discussions and the negotiation process a lot of times dishonestly because we don't put everything out onto the table, uh, nor do we approach the subject uh, from what I refer to as the high road. Getting others to be their very best, again, particularly from a management perspective. Learning the relationship between thinking and acting, imagining, creating, believing, and living. Recognizing that everything is connected directly and indirectly. Being able to connect the dots to conclusion and remembering that everything needs closure and that the timing of this is critical. Understanding that articulation offer, offer separates us the good from the best. Recognizing that perception is often reality and knowing when it's not. Learning how and why people behave the way they do and studying human nature. For those of you involved in wanting to make better decisions, particularly in the negotiation process, I can tell you for sure that the more you understand about human nature, the better you will be able to negotiate and the better you'll be able to make better decisions. Seeing the big picture and also paying attention to vital details, learning to focus, recognize that health is everything physical and emotional, learning to command but be respectful, listening well, understand that business is business and that personal is personal, learning to know when they are the same and when they are different. The whole COVID experience that every one of us has gone through has really melded the issue of business and personal more so than it ever has in our history. Being street smart, a lot of people refer to as a high degree of emotional intelligence of people who are street smart, recognizing when to be patient and when not to be, being more responsible and less fair, showing common sense, intuition and realistic perspective and forthright demeanor, all of which are virtues, being honest, considerate, direct and no nonsense, a lot of people have difficulty with those last three points, considerate, direct, and no nonsense, being traditional, contemporary, and futuristic, always influencing in a positive way, realizing that stimuli influence mindset beliefs, which causes thoughts, which influences behavior, which causes actions that influence results. We generally choose our stimuli, the beginning of how we perceive and ultimately influence the world. I appreciate the fact that I opened up by saying the whole idea is that our beliefs turn into actions and those actions turn into how we make decisions. Not sweating the small stuff, approaching every day with a positive can-do mindset, compromising everything except your values, creating win-win scenarios, extremely important in negotiation, reducing your emotional highs and lows to much more of a steady demeanor, talk taking well thought out risks, knowing when to exercise passion and compassion, knowing when to delegate, mentor, and lead, and always being grateful and living every moment and day as a gift, particularly after coming through the last year and a half. So another factor that comes involved in decision-making, and when you really peel back this onion, this is a very important part, is that fear is a huge factor in decision-making that causes bad decisions. Um, because there are consequences that can happen. And what we're concerned about is negative consequences. And that will directly influence the response that we put into place. Where does this all generate from? It's very interesting, again, when you peel back the onion, that we all have in our brain a little walnut-sized area called the amygdala. It's an almond-shaped group of neurons in the medial temporal lobes of the brain, which plays a central role in the processing and memory of emotions, especially fear. And the issue that comes into play here is that we were designed specifically to have this 
in our head so it would create a response. Appreciate the fact that this goes back, you can think about all the way to a caveman. His family is in the cave, if you can visualize this. And he walks outside the cave and there's a bear, a grizzly bear, one that could hurt him and his family. That emotion of fear comes right out of the amygdala and in that in our body it sets off a number of, of processes okay through the transmitting of various chemicals which then tells us that well are we going to run or are we going to fight this thing and if we're going to run well it sends a message to our muscles you know and starts to send chemicals in there that'll make those things work faster and stronger and if we're going to fight the same thing but also opens up neurons in our brain so that we could think very quickly and bring solutions that say, hey, we have a family inside. Maybe I better run inside the cave and block the entrance so that the bear can't come in. But appreciate the fact that a certain amount of people, when they first see that, might freeze and not take any action and then get eaten. Some may run at 90 miles an hour away and leave their family vulnerable to that attack. So in the most, you know, very basic understanding of this, it impacts how we make decisions. And it comes right back to how we make decisions again in our personal and business life, because what's the fear, okay? The fear manifests itself in the difficulty of processing and thinking. And really the issue is what if I make the wrong decision? And what are the consequences if I make that wrong decision? My God, I need to pick a vendor or a supplier. I need to renegotiate a deal. I'm being uh, trying to get something done at a much lower price or an expanse of services. What if, what if I fail, okay? And, and, and when we start to get into that circumstance, okay? That's when problems arise in how we think through the decisions. Fear creates stress, direct relationship, which tends to cause us to make bad decisions or no decisions at all, we freeze. It inhibits our ability to clearly think responsibly and fear also produces a lack of confidence and generally appreciate the fact when management sees that, okay, they're not gonna react very well. So how do we deal with this? The key is preparation. I came out of the military and I was in special ops and appreciate the fact that in special ops, um, we're only at the time 18, 19, 20 years old entering into these military programs. And now we're gonna be in a combat situation. Just appreciate the amount of fear that you would have, particularly with the consequence that death is on the table. But how do we beat and get past that? It's through preparation. We go to special training camp, Camp Pendleton in California, where we take eight weeks of highly experienced training and we are subject to every type of scenario that could possibly happen, training us and preparing us for that circumstance. So when it actually happens, I would tell you because I was there, is that you still have a certain degree of fear but you also still have a confidence that you're gonna be able to get through it. So preparation for anything is the most critical aspect of not allowing fear to influence heavily your decision-making process. Part of preparation relative to a business standpoint is mining, is developing resources and practicing what you need to do. And from that, a confidence is developed, which gets you over that hurdle of fear. Specifically, when we talk about the aspect of negotiation and making a decision and trying to influence behavior, okay, obtaining informa information and benchmarking where we should be is a critical aspect. One of the things that Kathy and I talked about as another potential webinar because uh, we do a lot of work in RFP management, request for proposal management. 
is one of the most ways of successfully preparing for an RFP is to successfully benchmark, okay, and obtain information that can be invaluable to the decisions you're ultimately going to have to make. Creating an approach and a strategy on how you plan to approach a decision, and then also creating a contingency or a plan B. And then creating time in the process to properly review and prepare, evaluate and analyze that information so that you're more greatly informed and you're now more prepared to enter into that negotiation or that decision so the results come out better. In obtaining information and benchmarking more specifically, we, it's a choice we make every day. Do we see the salespeople of potential vendors or we don't? The general tendency of procurement people is not to see as many, procure, as many salespeople as I believe they should. And I represent in a lot of the management training programs for procurement professionals that you should spend as much as eight to 10% of your time. If you talk about a 40 hour work week, that's four or five hours uh, a week that you need to be spending in terms of seeing potential vendors and suppliers, because that's one of your best ways to obtain information contemporary and also to benchmark. Procurement people attending trade shows and other promotional events where potential vendors and suppliers aggregate. There's no such greater event than a trade show, uh, an event, and obviously we know that they were put off the last year, but they're coming back. I already have signed up now for maybe five events already uh, this fall and into the winter that, that were put off from last year. That's where vendors and suppliers aggregate. Navigating Google, which is a great search engine and other search engines that are out there that are available that are more product specific. And then taking the time in how you manage your time to research and mine. Creating an approach and a strategy and a plan B is the SWOT analysis, strength, SWOT, weakness, opportunity, and threat analysis on how you're going to approach a particular decision that you have to make. The concept of managing RFPs, which is an organized, structured format that uses both quantitative and qualitative analysis to come down to the correct decision. And it documents your process so that if you're ever scrutinized by management, you have a response. And creating a plan B, contingency plan, what if we lose this supplier, if we lose this vendor, and no more so than what's happened in this COVID, have we been exposed to that circumstance happening? Negotiation strategies, creating a negotiation strategy, which will be modified depending upon each party that you're negotiating with and the individuals involved in that party. Mining, finding out information, creating RFPs that are not desired just to document the circumstances, but are set up to produce the results that you're looking for. And having continual vendor outreach throughout the year. You can be 100% satisfied with the vendors that service your, your business model, but you still should be talking to other competitors to know what's contemporary and to be able to benchmark. Other things to think about relative to the decision is how we go about selecting our vendor and creating both a quantitative and a qualitative basis to make that decision. How we go about managing those vendors, particularly ones that are in the tier one supplier category. The ability to reach internally, okay, who really are our customers, the various managers of the silos and the divisions and the operations in our company that we're servicing in procurement and supply chain. Creating parameters of the negotiation and parameters of the results that we're looking to achieve and how we go about making sure that we're timing things correctly and allowing the amount of time, particularly in the selection of vendors and suppliers, generally a three month lead time is, minima, is minimal. And the concept of best practices and things to think about is that we need to line up 
both the quantitative and the qualitative decision-making process and bring them as close as possible. We need to lose the fear in our decision-making process because fear creates a circumstance for making a bad decision. By preparing, we cut that out. And appreciate that negotiating, which we're doing all day long, both in our business and our personal lives, is a form of influencing or decision-making. And we need to understand and learn the value of that emotional intelligence and reflect on those two slides that I put, which give examples of, of how we can navigate uh, and raise the bar of emotional intelligence in our personal circumstance and learn to manage both the science and the art of decision science management. It'll lead to better, more informed decision-making leading to our success, both in our business and to ourselves personally. So with that, I appreciate your kind attention um, and we'll open it to any questions or comments that anybody might have. Um, we did have one comment. Uh, let me read this. Procurement professionals are generally risk adverse, especially in larger organizations, and understandably so. What is the best way to present innovative ideals and products to this group? I, um, <clears throat> I keep a turtle on my desk, um, and the turtle um, reminds me of something, um, which is that the turtle, in order to live, has to stick its shell out of stick its head out of the shell, and it has to stick its tail out of the shell in order for it to eat. It needs to uh, stick its tail out because it needs to poop, and it needs to stick its legs out in order to move from one point to the other. When it does that, it creates a risk because it then can be eaten. Okay, but if it doesn't stick it out, then uh, it's going to die anyway because it's not going to be able to eat and poop and move. Okay, reminds me of the fact that that we have risk every day when we get up and leave the house, and when it comes to business and it comes to procurement, is that you have to weigh the risk that's involved. Think about the decisions that your company makes overall as as a business decision. They're constantly taking risks. They're entering new markets. They're entering new products. They're out there hunting and doing things that create a certain amount of risk, senior management is generally not adverse to risk. Procurement managers are adverse to risk, okay? And I believe that they're adverse to risk mainly because of the concern involved in making the wrong decision. If we come back to that, that as I view it myself, personally, I view it that way, is that if we prepare properly, we see enough vendors, if we mine correctly, if we benchmark correctly, then we can minimize that risk and move the company forward. In, in the work that we do as a consultant in supply chain management, when we look at procurement, we'll see vendors and suppliers that have been in place for 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, never being seriously challenged on price, service, technology, um, uh, aggressive uh, areas of value add, okay? Um, and people get comfortable and complacent in procurement in those circumstances. And I think that, that uh, there's a certain amount of risk when we do make change and we do make those challenges, but properly prepared, those risks can be minimized and really produce greater results. So that's how I would answer that, that question. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and Tom, thank you for another um, very, very comprehensive presentation as always. Um, we will be sending out um, to all of our attendees today a copy of this recording. You're also gonna get a copy of the slides courtesy of Tom. And then um, of course your continuing educational hour for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, I did wanna just focus and let you know that next week we will be featuring two book interviews. So we're gonna be doing two um, book interviews uh, next week. So on July 14th, we're gonna have the authors of Managing Indirect Spend, Enhancing Profitability Through Strategic Sourcing. And that those, 
the authors are actually from Crescentric that will be joining us. And then on July 15th, we have the author of Advancing Through Influence. So I hope you can join us next week as well. And please look for uh, future uh, listings for all of our webinars. We're continuing to run our webinars through the summer. And uh, Tom will be back probably in the fall with us uh, for a couple of additional programs. So at this point, I'd like to thank you, Tom, and I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today and have a great day. Thank you.